I want to thank you all for um, inviting me to talk about alternative schools. Um, my history with Canada goes back to the 1960s, and my, which is as long as my personal history with alternative education. And last night when I was trying to figure out how to um, begin this talk, I um, had a, a, a memory that I haven't had in perhaps 35 years. I remember I was living in Berkeley at the time, and um, my alternative high school, Other Ways, had just been chased out of our building. One of five we'd been chased out of when we tried to establish ourselves as a viable public alternative. So, um, and this was in the middle of People's Park, in the middle of um, all kinds of chaos in Berkeley. So our school was at our house. And we had 35 to 50 kids coming in and out every day. And one day, a bunch of young, tough-looking guys drove up in motorcycles, didn't recognize them, didn't recognize their bikes. I was wondering, what in the world is going on here? And of course, my students, given that they were under a lot of pressure those days in Berkeley, were thinking, who's invading us now? Well, it turns out it was a bunch of um, high school students from Point Blank, I believe it was Point Blank School in Toronto. And they came and they said, um, George and Bob Davis sent us. And they never told me they were sending anybody. But these kids drove up and I said, all right, come on in. They were as delightful as any kids I've ever met, though I must say, they were rough and tumble working class kids. And um, they were on a project from their school. They had taken a motorcycle trip down from Toronto to Berkeley to film alternative schools. And it was quite wonderful. And they immediately hooked up with our students. And I immediately felt <clears throat> connected to something much larger than what I was doing in Berkeley and what other people were doing in some small places across the U.S. This was a time when lots of little seeds of alternative education were dropping throughout the country. People kept on saying there was an alternative school movement. I can guarantee you the movement was created by the media, not by us. Um, people said Herb Cole, John Holt, George Dennison, um, Jim Herndon, and all those people are creating a movement. The only way we met each other was through the article in Time magazine, which told us we were part of a movement. Though, fortunately, I got on the phone and called them all, and we tried to organize one. Now, what our goals those days were was to show that public education can be made to be flexible enough to provide different ways of learning, different ways of um, relating to students, different kinds of curriculum, without destroying a public school system for people who didn't want this kind of alternative. But basically, we wanted to pick up all those disillusioned, disappointed, and angry kids who had already dropped out and were playing in the park, but hungry to learn. So um, that's really how I was engaged in, began engaged in alternative schools. Now, I've never considered myself an alternative educator. I've always considered myself an educator. 
That is to say, I do the best thing I know how to do for kids with the most command of subject matter that I can possibly do, which is, if it's different, you can become, you call it alternative, you could be stigmatized, um, but most of all, the system don't want to move over. People who have had a long history of failing kids will not move over if something is working better than them. If anything, they will resent what you do. Um, and not one understands that. That's their job. I mean, it's their salary. It's their... Um, it's what roots them to um, their work for what it's worth. And so um, we've been fighting this now for 40, 50 years. However, these movements come and go. You know, um, at one point when in the 60s and 70s, people would say it's a nationwide movement. I had been around the country enough to know that it was a nationwide movement that affected no more than 10% of the kids. 90% was unchanged. And I think we have to be very humble about what we were capable of changing at that point and what we did change. We changed a certain sensibility, we helped a whole bunch of kids, and we began to pry open the system. Um, one of the questions that I've been asked is, what is the origin of alternative education in North America? Well, let's look at the beginning of public education in North America. There were before that home tutoring, elitist private schools, and church-related schools. When um, public education developed, there was a movement for democratic education. Um, Jefferson talks about this. Benjamin Franklin talks about this. Certainly Horace Mann talked about it. And Europe had already begun to do that with Pestalozzi and Froebel <coughs> and other people. So there was a democratic education movement affiliated with social movements. The uh, movement in Europe was in conjunction with the 1848 revolutions there and with the 1860 uprisings for increased democracy and with the creation of small nations rather than kingdoms. In the United States, the movement had to do with building an education adequate to a new democracy. That's what we were becoming, a new democracy. No models. If we had models, then I think things would have been very different. They would have been more orderly, less interesting, slightly more chaotic, but nevertheless less creative. Because when you got to start from scratch, you have to use what you have around. And one of the things we did was take a piece from here and a piece from there without abandoning what is to me central to all education. The benefit of the students, the development of creative thinking, uh, artistic skills, the um, development of political and social thought. In other words, um, the new citizen for a new democracy, as John Dewey would have said. So, um, we made those struggles. Now, I have to admit that in the course of my life, if you had asked me in the late 60s, mid-70s, I'd say, oh, we're really making way. 
we're really getting there. We're doing something. This is substantial and significant and um, will transform the schools and build the new society. Um, remember, this was during Kennedy's time and during the Johnson administration, during the civil rights movement, during so that alternative schools, at least in my experience, have always been connected with social movements for equity, justice, racial justice, and economic justice. Um, we haven't gotten that far. We've gotten many steps along the way. Things are much more hopeful than they were in the 50s when I began teaching. They are, st the task before us is enormous. Now, my students, who I still see, a lot of students of mine are in their early, late 50s and early 60s, have done exceptionally well. Those of them who have survived. A lot of the African American students did not survive the streets. I mean, you have to be hard and realistic about trying to do things for kids who've had a history of failure. You can rescue as many people as you can. You can nurture as many people as you can, but you're not going to always succeed. But you can't quit. That's been, uh, I think, one thing characteristic of me, um, sometimes exhausting, is refusal to quit. And then to do something that I learned to do is write about it. Through my writing to reach people's hearts and minds and their pedagogical souls. That is to say, their sense of what kind of learning they would like their kids to have and they would like themselves to have. Now, the birth of alternative education out of the creation of new democracies still going on, so far as I'm concerned. We have a lot of steps forward, we have steps backwards. Um, struggle for justice is still incomplete. It's not done. The increase in poverty in the United States and the decay of regular public schools, and my early writing talked about how inadequate the schools were to serve poor kids, in particular Latino and African American kids, is the same exact struggle going on now 45 years later. Um, perhaps a little bit more cynical now because though a middle class has been created from what used to be the poorest of the poor, people are descending into poverty again. And so the problem remains enormous. The educational challenges are the same, and alternative educators, as long as they keep in mind that quality education, struggle for social justice, an attempt to tell people outside of your small world of small alternative world what you're doing, and the attempt to be humble enough to say that you're in process means that you won't give up and that you can continue the fight and continue the struggle. I think now there are new factors in school reform. They used to call me a reformist but or a school reformer, but what I've always claimed, though people pay no attention, is that, no, I'm a good educator, not a reformer. Why reform something that doesn't work? You know, um, some people heard that 
a lot of people didn't want to hear it, and some people, it went in this ear, came out this nostril. You know, um, <clears throat> the, uh, now there are new factors involved. The new factors come from the fact that there's a large-scale social acknowledging acknowledgement of the failure of a, on a massive level of schools for the poor, for students of color, of disillusion with the white middle class, with um, public education. So in a sense, a lot of things we were saying in the 60s is now common knowledge. But the problems that have arisen are one, the teachers very often, there are wonderful, wonderful teachers in the world. They're very creative and bold and courageous teachers who will take the leadership in change, but most teachers don't have the courage and don't want to be dislodged and don't want to take responsibility for the performance of their students. The same thing is true with a lot of parents. So what we end up with is a um, new feature in school change. That is the corporate feature. Now the corporations say, well, we're going to be the reformers. Not you crazies on the left, not you um, humanists, not you um, soft-hearted people. We need to use business strategies <clears throat> and standardized testing to reform schools. Well, what I have to say is I've been there three times, and it didn't work all three times. It's not going to work again. And the kids are just as alienated. And the reaching them through brutalizing them pedagogically, through putting them down, through testing, through sorting them out, through picking the good ones from the bad ones, through things like an elitist charter school, a charter school for the poor. These things have been tried, and people don't acknowledge that, over and over and over again. And it is a new education, a new dedication to education from the heart and mind that is called for right now. And it's called for joint leadership from community people, from parents, from teachers. There are some very good administrators and even a politician every now and then. And I think that I would like to reassert my hope that things can fundamentally change, that there is hope to make <clears throat> not just the schools better, but when we make the schools better, we make the society better. When we lift up the kids, they lift us up. They lift the whole culture up. And it can be wonderful. But it's not right now, and we have a big job ahead of us.